Hi, my name's David Hillier and I'm going to give a short video today on market equilibrium and also I will be talking a little bit about a term which is one of the most important terms in finance and that is called beta and beta represents risk. I have a website which is www.davidhillier.com and on the website I also have a number of articles that I uh, basically write about in finance and I'm going to be following my book uh, which is corporate finance. I do have a corporate finance course that you might be interested in and this is just one part of that overall corporate finance course which you can get on YouTube. So without further ado the first thing I want to speak about is market equilibrium. Market equilibrium is a theoretical term. It basically tells us about what happens when everything is going well in the markets, that there are no shocks, and it's simply what you would expect to occur in, in, from, as normal. Now, we have a, a couple of terms that we like to talk about in finance, and uh, what they relate to is two things. One is the ability of an individual investor, and the other is the information that an individual investor has. If I have a certain level of ability and I have an information set, that's the information I have to make a decision, I will arrive at a particular decision. Now, if everyone has the same ability and if everyone has the same information, it means that everyone will arrive at the same decision. And we say when everyone has the same ability and the same information, we say that we have homogeneous expectations. So homogeneous expectations just relates to the fact that everyone believes the same thing and everyone makes the same decision. Now, that isn't realistic, clearly, uh, but it's a very good simplifying assumption and allows us to go on and uh, look at a number of different um, things that go on in the markets and the homogeneous expectations is the basis for most of our uh, theories in finance. Well, not, not most of them, but a lot of them. Now, the opposite of homogeneous expectations is heterogeneous expectations. And heterogeneous expectations basically says that investors have different levels of ability and they have different information. Now, you can develop a number of theories using heterogeneous expectations as well, but they tend to be a lot more complex. And so in finance, we're just going to focus on homogeneous expectations. If everyone has the same ability and everyone has the same information set, then everyone makes the same decision. And if everyone makes the same decision, then that leads us to a very interesting outcome. Because in previous lectures, I showed how uh, you can arrive at an optimal portfolio. And from that optimal portfolio, you can then decide what your risk tolerance is going to be. So in this video here, in this slide here, uh, we have point A, which is the optimal portfolio. If you don't know where I got that, then please just look at a previous video in my video series and uh, I explain this fully then. But that's the optimal portfolio. Now, if everyone believes the same thing, then it means that everyone will arrive at this optimal portfolio. And if everyone holds the same optimal portfolio, then effectively we say that is the market portfolio. And that comes directly from our homogeneous expectations that in a world where everyone has the same ability and everyone has the same information set, then all investors will only one, hold one portfolio of risk assets. And since it's the only portfolio of risk assets, it has to be the market. And uh, we, that's where the market portfolio comes from. Now, a key thing there is that the weights of the assets in uh, the market portfolio correspond to the value of each of the assets in that market portfolio. So if you've got a very large company uh, then in a country, then that will have a higher weighting in that, the market portfolio because it's large in comparison to all other, all other companies. So that's a key result. In, in market equilibrium, market equilibrium, all investors hold only one portfolio 
of risky assets. And once you've got that portfolio of risky assets, you can decide how much risk you want to take on by combining it with the risk-free asset. And that means that we will have a portfolio combination of the risk-free asset and the risky asset somewhere along this risk return uh, line here. And we call that the capital market line. So we're now going to go on and talk about uh, beta. And beta is a measure of risk. And the best way to explain it is by using an example. Now, we're, we see that we've got four different states of the economy. You have two bull markets. Bull markets means that the economy is doing well. And you have two bear markets. Now, we only have two outcomes uh, for the market return. And that's the market portfolio. Uh, you either the market returns 15% or it's minus 5%. And then we can say for a company, and we're just going to look at one company here, that if the market return is 15%, then there's a 55% chance that the return on the company will be 25%, and there's a 50% chance that the return on the company will be 15%. And similarly, if the return in the market is minus 5%, it's a bear market, then there is a 50% chance that the return in the company will be minus 5%. And a 50% chance that the return on the company will be minus 15%. So we're going to graph this now. Um, sorry, before we graph that, well, no, let's just look at the graph. So if we look at the graph here, you see that when the market return, this is the market return here, it's on the horizontal axis, and the return on the security is on the vertical axis. When the market return is minus 5%, then you've got two potential outcomes, here and here. Uh, that's minus 5 and minus 15. And similarly, if the market return is 15%, we have two outcomes. The return may be 25% or it may be 15%. So what is the expected return on this company? Well, the expected return in this company is um, what we've got is we've got 50% of 25% plus 50% 50 50 of 15% gives us an expected return in the company of 20%. We can do that for the bear market. What's the expected return on the company in the bear market? It's 50% of minus 5 plus 50% of minus 15. And that gives you an expected return of minus 10%. And that is the point here and here on this line. Now we say that the, the line which is in the, the space where you're, you're plotting the return on a security against the return in the market, we call it characteristic line. And we also can look at the risk of this company because the risk of the company is, if you think about it, it's, it's a bit like saying, well, what, how, how much, how high will the company go if the market goes up? And how low will the company go if the market goes down? And so if the, the company is risky, then it means it will go really high if the market is, goes up and it will go really low if the market goes down. That is a, a very high slope, very positive slope, a large positive slope here. And alternatively, if it's a low risk security, then if the market goes up, the security won't really go up. So it might be here, say. And if the market goes down, the security won't really go down. So you have a line which has got a, a, a smaller slope. And so the slope is a good measure of risk. And we call that slope beta. And now I will show this theoretically uh, in a future lecture about how you actually get beta. But for just now, uh, we're just using examples to show intuitively what beta is. So the beta is um, a measure of the slope. And it's basically it's a measure of the how responsive a securities return is to the market return. If the beta is zero, that is the slope is zero, then it means that the security doesn't have any relationship to the market. If the market is 15% or the market is 5% return, then the beta of zero, you would just see that the return on the security would be, say, 10%, irrespective of the market return. If the beta is negative, that means that then the return in the market is positive. Um, oh, no, so if the return in the market goes up, then the return on security will go down. And that similarly, if the return in the market is negative, then uh, the return on security will be positive. That's a, a negative beta because then you've got a negative slope here. And 
that does exist in the financial markets, but it exists as an insurance policy. And, you know, so you might have a security that's like got some insurance characteristics so that if, you know, the best thing is to think about if a house goes on fire, your insurance policy pays off. So you lose value from the loss of value in the house, but you then get a payoff from your insurance uh, policy. So that is a negative beta. But most assets in the market uh, will have a positive beta so that when the market return goes up, the economy, the company's return will go up. When the market goes down, the company's return will be negative. We can look at betas of different companies and uh, you can see here that uh, there's quite a lot of variation in beta. Now these are European companies and you can see that you, that you have the lowest um, beta, the lowest risk company is L'Oreal and the highest risk company here is Renault. So you've got quite a lot of variation there. Uh, the, I would actually say that the beta of the market should be one. Why? Well, it has to be one because if you've got the market return here and you've got the market return here, then every time the market return goes up by 15%, then the market return goes up by 15%. Any time it goes down by 5%, the market goes down by 5%. So you have a slope that effectively is uh, equal to one. And... That is, so we've got another uh, factor there that we've got the market beta is equal to one. What about the risk-free rate? Well, the risk-free rate is risk-free, so it doesn't depend on the market. So that means that the beta of a risk-free asset will be equal to zero. So again, we've got more information there just by even just working with uh, the companies um, themselves and just working with examples without even going into any theory. But we will need to know a formula, and the formula looks a bit scary. Uh, but if you've done any ordinary least squares regression, uh, and that is a statistical method, then all you've got there is just basically the formula for the slope using ordinary least squares regression. And what you've got is just the covariance between the return on the asset and the return on the market divided by the variance of the market. So again, we said that the, the beta of the risk-free asset was equal to zero. So given that the risk-free asset doesn't vary with the market, so the covariance has got to be zero here. If that's zero, then beta has to be equal to zero. If we, we said that the beta of the market was equal to one, so the covariance of the market with itself is simply the variance. So the variance divided by the variance is equal to one. Now the other thing is, in, is that the, the sum of all the betas in a, in a market of all assets with weights equivalent to their market value, the, they will all add up to one. So if you multiply the beta of an asset by the, the weight of its market value in comparison to all the assets, then and you add all the assets uh, up, you end up getting a beta of one. So... Those things uh, I've gone through quite quickly, and uh, you know I, I would recommend that you read my book, Corporate Finance, if you want to go into this in more detail. And hopefully, I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.